The Story of the Lighthouse, Public versus Private Goods, told by Professor Don Wells, Professor Emeritus in the Economics Department at the University of Arizona. After graduating from DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana in 1958, I figured I'd go to work for some bank in Chicago, but I had a bad experience, so I needed to take some time off. I had grown up in the Midwest and lived there all my life. Here I was, a college graduate, and I'd never seen an ocean. I packed up my car at Corvair and took off for Boston. After staying in Boston for a few days, I decided to travel up the New England coast to Maine. Have you ever been to Bar Harbor, Maine, just north of Acadia National Park? Did you ever drive about 20 miles farther south to Bass Harbor? Notice all the little islands in the Atlantic Ocean outside of Bass Harbor. I saw a for sale sign on a lighthouse and thought to myself, I wonder if I can earn enough income from operating the lighthouse to cut out a good living. I had studied economics and I just figured that the lighthouse was really just an insurance business. I would be insuring ship's safety so that they didn't crash into the smaller outlying islands. The lighthouse was vacant so I sat there and watched the ships go by. Later that day, I went into town and talked to some town folks. I asked them where the ships were heading. They told me the ships traveled back and forth from Newfoundland and Virginia. I knew the ships traveling along the coast during the day were able to see the outer islands, but I thought, maybe I can make some money. If I bought the lighthouse and charged shipping companies a fee to keep the light on at night, Maybe the shipping companies would pay me money. Shipping companies would benefit because they could ship goods around the clock, but more importantly, I would benefit by getting paid. So I did some research and found out there were 26 shipping companies running a total of 130 night trips per month past the Bass Harbor Lighthouse. The problem was they all had to go farther out to sea as to not get their ships grounded on the outer islands. This obviously would increase their cost of doing business. So I contacted the shipping companies to find out how much they'd be willing to pay if I were to turn the light on for them at night. They came up with a price of $10 for every time their ships passed the lighthouse. I did some quick calculation and figured at $10 times 130 shifts, this would bring in $1,300 per month. Now remember, this was 1958 and $1,300 per month was a lot of money back then. So was I going to make a lot of money? Well, you don't know. I had to figure out my cost of operating the lighthouse. I would have to take out a mortgage to purchase the lighthouse, get a new generator, buy fuel, purchase a new light, and so on. I figured my cost would be about $800 per month. Well, you don't have to be an accountant to figure this out. I would be bringing in $1,300 per month, which is my total revenue, and only shelling out $800 per month, my total cost. I'd be making a profit of $500 per month or $6,000 per year. In today's dollars, that would be about $45,000 per year. Not bad for just graduating from college. Heck, accountants in Chicago stockyards at the time were only making $5,500 per year, and they worked 40 hours a week, five or six days a week. All I had to do once a night was click. Fairly easy job, don't you think? I quickly scrambled to get the money together to start the lighthouse. I bought it, fixed up everything, and then, click, I was ready to be in the lighthouse business. By the time I put this all together, though, the number of shipping companies had gone down from 28 companies to 26. 
and the number of ships traveling by night went down from 130 ships to 126. Oh well, instead of bringing in $1,300 per month, I would only be bringing in $1,260 per month. Even though I'd be bringing in less, I was still proud of myself. So that I didn't run into a cash flow problem, I quickly sent out invoices to the shipping companies stating that their fees were payable within one week. After seven days, only four shipping companies had paid me for the nine ships that passed by the lighthouse for a total of only $90. I was puzzled, but more importantly, I was nervous, if you know what I mean. I quickly sent out a second notice, a firmer notice this time, that stated, pay now or else. I quickly put these in the mail. Then I thought, Pay or else what? I got no responses. The rest of the shipping companies didn't respond. I thought to myself, how can I turn the light on just for my paying customers and turn it off for those who weren't paying? I thought about hiring teenagers to walk up and down the shores at night looking for the ships who were paying for my service. Then, as the owner of a lighthouse, I thought that wouldn't be a very bright idea. So one day, I went into town to grab a bite to eat, and I started talking to the guy next to me at the restaurant. He was a lawyer. So I bought him his lunch and got some free, quote-unquote, legal advice. You all know there's no such thing as free, quote-unquote, lunch. He said I should have gotten contracts signed by the shipping companies. I told him I thought the shipping companies had colluded and that's why only four of them paid me. He said he didn't think that was the case. So the very next day I wrote out the contracts and mailed them. Within a few days I received only four signed contracts, but at least they were signed. Within two and a half months I had to give up the lighthouse business. I turned off the lights and informed the four shipping companies that I was no longer in business. Oh, don't feel sorry for me, though. I turned the lighthouse into a rental property. The lighthouse had three stories and a stairway. I rented out all three floors. Lower level, not much privacy. Middle level, semi-private. Top level, private. If the people didn't pay, they didn't get the room. I kicked them out. By the way, I rented the rooms by the year, by the month, by the day, or by the hour. There was a problem, though. If you rented the top floor and wanted to read by the light, you had to walk around in circles. It was quite exhausting, if you know what I mean. When this lighthouse ordeal was all said and done, I was mad at my instructors. What was it that they never taught me while I was in business school? This is the moral of the story, everyone. There is a difference between a public good, the light, and a private good, the rental rooms inside the lighthouse. A public good be in the light and the private good be in the rooms. Public goods are non-excludable and private goods are excludable. Now, what does this mean? In the story, there was no way to prevent non-paying shipping companies from not seeing the light. That means it was non-excludable. You couldn't exclude anyone from seeing the light. The payment of the rental rate and key to the room prevents others from using the room, a private good. It made those rooms excludable. The other aspect of public goods and private goods is public goods are non-rivalrous and private goods are rivalrous. Now, what does that mean? In the story, one ship's ability to see the light doesn't stop other non-paying ships from seeing the light. The light, a public good, is not rivalrous. The private good, the rooms, are rivalrous in that one person's rental of the room prevents others from renting that same 
room. I hope this gives you a better idea of the difference between a public good and a private good. This is a story made up and told by Professor Emeritus Don Wells at the University of Arizona.